have been in a sermon series on the power of prayer. We, we're talking about one particular passage of Scripture where we saw a miracle happen in the life of Peter as he uh, was placed in, in prison and they were about to take his life uh, for the cause of the gospel. And, and we're going to uh, backtrack just a little bit and get a running, a running start into it. And uh, we will conclude that sermon series today, uh, Lord willing, uh, we'll be in Acts chapter 12. As you're turning there, we have a delicacy around our house, and it's this great concoction called taco soup. Now, that may not sound the best in the world to you, but if you've ever had it, <laughs> it's wonderful. I mean, it's like really good. It's like you have to pray for forgiveness afterwards good. I mean, it's just good stuff, right? And uh, the thing about taco soup, I've, I've cooked it many times myself. I don't do as good a job on it as my mother does. And, uh, I, I, but I, I've done it a time or two and can do it if uh, the need arises for it. But the thing about taco soup is this. You have to season it uh, just, just one step at a time. You don't just throw everything in a pot and stir it all together. You have to season it a certain way. You have to make sure that the meat's seasoned for it. And you have to make sure that uh, uh, you get the right kinds of chips and cheese and sour cream. And, <laughs> you know, it is time to dismiss, isn't it, come to think about it. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. But uh, in talking about this, it's a, it, it matters. The little things that you do in this taco soup makes it that much better. And the thing that I've talked to you about over the last couple of weeks is that some of the little things uh, or things that we consider as minor may make all the difference in the church. And the, uh, this has given me the ability to advocate and to promote the power that comes in when a church unifies and prays together, that the miraculous can happen, not through us, but through the power of God making, it, making himself manifest uh, in us and through us and doing things that we can only explain by giving God the glory. That is the miraculous. And God still does the miraculous. In Acts chapter 12, we'll begin reading in verses 1 through 5. And then we'll kind of uh, cover the story lightly and get into today's portion of the message. So if you have your copy of God's Word ready, let's stand to honor and reverence the reading of God's holy and inspired Word. Acts chapter 12, we'll begin the first five verses. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the, uh, of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four ordinaries of so uh, soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Father, in Jesus' name, we're thankful to be able to hear your word proclaimed. We understand that it is a special privilege to hear from you. And God, I just pray that these would be your words, not mine. I pray that this would be your truths, not my opinion. And I pray that this would be the type of truth that will transform this entire congregation into a a praying congregation, Father, that we would have a, a focus on prayer, and God, that we would uh, exert great energy and time in prayer, Father, because we know that you answer prayer. So, Lord God, I pray today for your anointing. I pray for holy fire from on high to proclaim your truths, and I pray that, Father, you'd forgive me of any way that I failed you, that I may be a fit vessel for your honor and your glory. When the time of decision comes, I pray that people will respond because they've heard the call of your Holy Spirit. And I pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to catch you up what's happened over the last couple of weeks in the text, keep your Bibles open. I'll show this to you, and then we'll get into today. The first thing I talked to you about in the series was that the praying church brings rest. What happens is you see in verse 6, uh, Herod brought him forth, brought Peter forth, and the same night uh, Peter was found sleeping. They were about to kill Peter for the cause of the gospel. And here you see uh, Peter is uh, surrounded by guards and he's asleep. He is resting. And so I will tell you this, that people are struggling today to rest and to find peace of mind. But that can be found through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The second thing that we talked about was that the praying church brings release. As you look in verse 7, you see that the angel of the Lord came and this light was in the prison and shined. And uh, he smote Peter on the side and raised him up. And the chains fell off. And he told Peter, get your stuff. We need to get you dressed and get you out of here. And so they uh, took off. And then last week we looked, and this is where we're going to pick up. In verse 5 it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. We talked about the fact that God answers prayers, that God gives us the privilege of prayer, and that he is made available through prayer, and that we as a church just need to simply take him up on it. We need to approach the throne of God with boldness, with confidence, because God said that we can cry out to Him with our prayers and our supplication and our thanksgiving as well. Don't forget to be a thankful people. And with that being said, you, you go on down into verse 12, and it says that when He considered the thing, He came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, For thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is an angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. That he beckoned unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go shoot these things to James and the brother. And he departed and went to an, into another place. Now I think it's important to notice off of, off, off of today, uh, today's passage that Peter uh, could have said, Yeah, I'm here. Or Peter could have said, uh, Yes, I was able to break out. But he declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. You see, when God brings you out of the bondage, you should give him the glory for it. Amen. And I believe with all my heart that people are in bondage today more now than ever. And what needs to take place is a release from the bondage that we're under. And we need to be careful once we see deliverance happen. We need to be careful to give God the honor and the glory and the praise because He deserves it. But we also need to celebrate it as, uh, as His church because God will continue to do great things when we give Him the glory for it. And I see that as something we need to uh, emphasize. When we invest in a prayer over the concerns of the church, it's important to celebrate the victories that God leads us to. We should be a celebrating group of people. And I know that there's a little bit of a stigma, and I, I have a chip on my shoulder about this one. I believe there's a little bit of a stigma about Baptists that we don't like to celebrate, or we're quiet, and we're, you know, we, we just kind of sit in the pew, and that's all there is to it. But I, I aim to change that because I believe even though we may be Baptists, I believe we can still celebrate with the best of them. Amen. And I believe that we should be a people that do celebrate what God is doing and that He is at work. You don't leave this to some other denomination. We, we are not concerned about what other denominations are doing, other churches are doing. That's not our business. Our business is the Belmont family, and we are going to celebrate. When God does something great, we need to celebrate it. Now, the emphasis point of today is the last part of the message, and it's this, that the praying church brings relief. The praying church brings relief. I want you to look at verse 18. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers, what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. So what we see here is those that were, you know, watching over Peter and those that were perhaps even mistreating him uh, because, uh, again, and like this Christianity thing that was happen happening, that was, uh, they needed to get it under control. And matter of fact, they were absolutely trying to wipe it out. Herod turned on those. 
that were garbage. And you see, there's a matter of relief that takes place there because God saw to it that they were off of Peter's back. Let me explain a couple of things to you about this history. <laughs> Roman law required that if a guard permitted the escape of a prisoner, that he would receive the same punishment that was due the prisoner. This further teaches us that it was intended that Peter was going to be put to death. And so because they allowed for this escape to take place, you're going to get the same punishment he was going to get. <laughs> Now, why is that a relief? It was a relief that if Herod wanted to, he could have sent them out to hunt Peter down. But you see, God still had a work for Peter. And so his plan was going to come about. And so God said, I'm going to take out those that would hunt him down so that Peter can, can, can continue until I'm through with him. When God has a plan, he protects them. And God always gives the strength and the ability to carry out what he has for his people to do. We need to remember that not only strength, but also the time that we need, the uh, resources that we need. Everything will be available to us as God sees fit. When God has a plan, he makes sure that it comes through. And I, I see this. Here And I, I, I'm trying to reconcile my mind to it and, and get across that God himself is able to move, even if it's the life of, of, of other people that are against us. God is able to move what he needs to move in order to accomplish his will. Now, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 12 says this. It's a good verse for you. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So in other words, you may want to rise up against God's plan, but I would caution you, you may not want to do that. Because when it says here that, God, that the Lord is against them that do evil, I don't know about you, but that makes me fearful. That makes me afraid. I do not want God against me. And it's imperative to get across to you that you want God for you, not against you. When you think about God being for you, you think about a sovereignty first. You think about the fact that God is the one that can breathe life into and he can take life away. You think about God and his blessings. He is able to give blessings to and he's able to take blessings away. And I think about his, uh, his anointing, his Holy Spirit, uh, his hand being upon us. God is able to give that and to place his hand on us. And he's also able to take it away. And as a pastor of a church that I love, as a shepherd, I aim and I pray and I beg God, please keep your hand on us. Keep using us. Keep doing great things in this church. Uh, folks, if you haven't noticed this, God continues to add to the church. That is God's blessing to us. And what I see is that God is going to continue this. So what we need to do is set ourselves up to be under the will of God to have his hand upon us as opposed to being against us. I believe if we get out of the will of God, very easily he could take his hand off of us, and that scares me. So I'm asking you, not only to be willing to move when he says to move, but be willing to move at the time he says to move. Sometimes God will hold you back and say, no, it's not the right time. If you remember the story of, of David, he wanted to do this census, and God tried to warn him and said, no, you don't need to take the census yet. David wanted to go ahead and do it. And what happened is it caused punishment to fall on the people. And so there's a time for everything. And as a pastor, it is my responsibility to go before the throne of God and to say, God, when do you want us to move on this? How do you want us to move? And it's my responsibility to give to you 
what God has given to me that we, went, we may move the way He wants us to move, the time that He wants us to move, and things like that. But that needs you to be praying that we don't miss it. I need you to be praying that I hear it clearly. I need you to be praying that the church is willing to move the direction that God wants us to move. Again, I just see God doing a great thing here and I don't want to stop. And I want you to be a part of it. And I fear the Lord. I'm told that's the beginning of wisdom. And I fear, I fear Him taking His hand off of us. Now, am I saying that something is being done wrong? That's not it. I'm just wanting to give this reminder to you that I want to continue to seek the Lord's face. You see, the philosophy that I have on it, I believe, is, is biblical, that this church belongs to the Lord. And if that's truly the case, then I want the Lord to be able to do with this church as He sees fit. I'm reminded, too, in this particular story, that in Acts chapter 12, verse 21, you can see this for yourself, if you'd like. Verse 21 says, And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and he made an oration unto them. Now, I want you to catch this, because this is important. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave God, he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, to talk a little history with you, what's kind of transpired here. Herod Agrippa I was the grandson of Herod the Great, who issued a decree for all of Bethlehem's male children to be murdered. You hear about that during the, uh, the Christmas season, usually. Herod the Great had Agrippa's father put to death because he viewed him as a threat to the throne. And Agrippa was also the nephew of Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist beheaded. You know that story as well. And Agrippa carried on the family tradition by beheading James, the brother of John. And today's story finds him about to execute Peter. So they didn't really care about people that much. In other words, if they view anybody as a threat to their throne, then they would just take care of it. They would just uh, wipe them out. They would just take them out. But you see, God was not through with Peter yet. God still had a plan for Peter. And so God wasn't all about to allow something to happen to Peter. In other words, the boy wasn't through preaching yet. And so God was going to protect him. Now Proverbs 11.8 says this, the righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. Any of y'all remember a story about a man named Haman that hung on his own gallows? You ever remember that story? In other words, sometimes when you devise a plan and you're going after God's anointed, you know what's going to happen? You're going to hang on your own gallows. Don't be surprised if you're going after or against the plan of God that God will bring about a punishment to you or will withhold blessings from you. In other words, it's important for us to follow the plan of God, to be in the center of God's will, that when trouble comes, we would be amongst those that are delivered out of trouble as opposed to uh, amongst the wicked uh, that are placed in uh, harm's way. Jewish historian Josephus recorded that Herod Agrippa uh, had a bowel problem, and he died five days later in 44 AD. The Greek word that is used for worm here is, is the word that we would uh, translate or consider take worms. In that part of the world, the sheep would come in contact with the worm through feces or spoiled meat, and they would pass it along to a dog, which would in turn pass it along to a human. And the worm would grow cysts inside of the liver, and the cyst would then rupture. It was very painful. And it would cause sudden agonizing death. Josephus and history both tell us that he contracted the worm, and he lived for five days. And during that five-day course, he was in extreme agony. 
You see, I guess the lesson is here, you don't mess with God's anointing. You don't mess with God's anointing. In 1 Chronicles 16, 22, it tells us the very same thing. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. I want to turn your attention as we're talking about this to uh, the book of Kings, uh, actually 2 Kings chapter 2. And I want to show you another uh, illustration from the Bible about this very, uh, very same idea. You may, uh, may not be familiar with this story. I, I don't think you're going to hear a lot of sermons about it because it's, it's not pretty, but it is pretty important for you to know. In 2 Kings chapter 2, I want you to look in verse 23. It's about a fellow named Elisha. You may have heard of it. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23, it says and he, and it's talking about Elisha, went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him. And said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. And he went thence unto Mount Carmel, and from thence he turned, returned to Samaria. And you say, Pastor, that's a tough passage of Scripture, and I can't believe that you're bringing that story up. Well, first off, it's in God's words, so it's important. Second off, I want to give you some warning. You don't mess with God's anointing. And I'm not just talking about uh, me. Here's the pastor of this church. I'm talking about when God's got his hand on somebody and is moving, you need to pray for them. Don't protest them. And now, uh, these, these young people had said uh, to Elisha, they, they called him bald head, and I think uh, people are, are using far worse than that today when they talk about Christians. But let God deal with that. In other words, you keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, as the Scripture says. In other words, you make sure you do the right thing. It doesn't matter who's doing what's wrong. You handle yourself the correct way. And God will protect you and see uh, that, that he's going to bring about his plan in your life. As a matter of fact, I believe the scripture also teaches us that when people come against us, not only are we in good company because they did it to the prophets as well, they did it to our Savior. But Jesus warned us that that would be the case. That people will stand against you for standing for the right things. And I would remind you that just as God handled this situation on Elisha's behalf, he'll handle whatever's going on in your life. God is able to stand and to do more than we would ever think of. And so these ideas of revenge and vengeance does not need to pollute your mind anymore. As a matter of fact, I will tell you today, as a part of what I'm encouraging you to do, is to step away from the revenge, step away from the vengeance, lay those things down because they will hinder your walk with the Lord. They will eat you alive. And God is able to repay those things far better than you could ever devise a plan. Now, I don't know about you, but I watch these shows at the time to time, not, not a whole lot, but every now and then, where people sit up all night and they think about how they're going to how are they going to get revenge? And so I, I see some of us sitting there in the, in the bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, staring at the ceiling, trying to think about how we're going to carry out revenge on somebody that did us wrong. Folks, you need to let that go. You need to let that go. It is bondage in and of itself. And you need to be delivered from that, knowing that it will eat you alive. So you need to ask for God to intervene in your life. Even pray and ask Him to handle the situation if you want. But you don't carry it out in the wrong way. You make sure that you have kept yourself clean before God. Pure before God. And you let God handle it. You say, well, that's so hard for me to do. Ooh, I know it. I get it. This is not easy preaching. 
it would be more simple for me to say, go handle your business and be done with it. But I'm telling you that the scriptural thing to do is to allow God to handle it. Walk away from some revenge or some bad feelings or some hurt that you've got in your life. You say, I've been carrying this around 20, 30 years. I've been carrying this hurt around and I can't just drop it off one day. Through the power of God you can. And it still may come up every now and then in your mind. It still may become difficult from time to time in your life. But I assure you on the authority of God's word, if you'll give it to him, he will walk you through it. And the days when it gets the best of you and you're laying there in bed and you just can't deal with it anymore. And you're laying there trying to figure out how, how you're going to survive this. If you'll just allow God to take it over, what he'll do is deliver, uh, deliver you from that situation. He'll deal with what's coming against you, and you'll give him the honor and the glory and the praise, and you'll wake up one day and say, you know what, today was easier than it was two weeks ago. Amen. You'll find yourself beginning to prosper again. Because when you're bent on revenge and vengeance, which, by, by the way, God said vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will be so he'll do it. When you take that out of the hands of God and you say, I'm going to carry it out, you're not allowing God to be God, are you? You're putting yourself in the place of God saying, I can handle it better than God can. And that's not healthy nor right. It will begin to hinder your prayer life. It will hinder your walk. It will hinder your ministry. It will eat you up. And in the name of Jesus, what I want to see happen today is I want to see people come to the altar and throw it down and walk out in freedom. I want to see people say, I've been carrying this around for so long, I can't get rid of it. If you can't get rid of it, if you can't place it down, what I'll do is I'll call somebody down here to pray for it. You don't have to tell them all your business unless you want to. But they can stand in the gap for you. They can pray for you. Pray for this deliverance for you. And allow you to walk in freedom. Sometimes my back gets so bad that if we've been on a trip, riding is terribly difficult for me. Driving is it's just it's, it's difficult for me. And after a long trip, sometimes I'm barely able to even make it in the house. And I'll have to ask my, my children, would you please come and help us to get the suitcases in? I, I can't bend. I can't uh, pick up anything right now. I just can't. I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. And I would say the same thing needs to happen for you today. Maybe you've been carrying this baggage around so long that you're tired and you can't carry it anymore. And you need somebody to help you to carry that baggage all the way to the throne, drop it off, and you never have to pick it up again. In other words, you can walk in liberty today. <clears throat> but you have to step out in faith. And God will honor it. Does that mean tomorrow you won't struggle with it? No, you may struggle even worse tomorrow, but here's the difference. The difference is that God's going to walk you right through it. And you'll never be alone. I'm reminded of this story as we go into our time of decision. It, it come a time in this young man's life where he just needed a good talk with his dad kind of behind the woodshed, if you know what I mean. And he just got a little cocky and, and it kind of, it's kind of time for man-to-man -man talk outside a little bit. And, um, by the way, men, we need to talk man-to-man -to, -man to our sons uh, sometimes. We, we just need to make sure that they understand they need to be on the godly path. So sometimes that needs to happen, I understand. But this young man was, uh, he stepped back there and uh, his dad uh, kind of talked to him and said, son, you, uh, you, you, need to, you need to begin to pray. And, and the, the, the young boy looked at him and said, daddy, I know what's about to happen. Does God have a fax number? Because I need to get this through to him quick. <laughs> well, you don't need a fax number for God. You've got a direct line to the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, if you've been walking and carrying around this vengeance, this spirit of, uh, of aggravation, and, and, and you just need to, be, you need to turn loose of some stuff, I'm going to ask you in Jesus' name to step out in faith 
and allow God to begin to work in the situation. That's what our invitation is going to be for. When I start praise team and our musicians to go ahead and come on up. If you need to be set free from the bondage of carrying around burdens that you should never be carrying around, I'm going to ask you to step out in faith and come and let us pray for you and help you. Second to that, if you've never come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to ask you today to step out in faith and ask Jesus Christ to save you because we're told in His Word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I believe. Third, you may be looking for a good church home. You may say, I want to be a part of a church that, that's preaching the Word, that's uh, putting an emphasis on prayer. And that's trying to move forward for the cause of the gospel. This family right here called Belmont will not look down on anybody for coming today. Matter of fact, we will celebrate you coming down today. And I would ask you, if you're looking for a good church home, I know a good church home. I know the place where friends become family. I would ask you to join up with us. So if God is moving in your life and in your heart and he's putting in, step out in obedience. And would you come forward? Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to take that message and cleanse it from any error or any mistake that I've made. And I'm asking you, Father, in this time of decision, that your Holy Spirit would work, that lives would be changed in whatever way that needs to happen. And God, ahead of time, I give you the honor and the glory and the praise for what's going to happen. And we want to claim victory today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand.